most of that information inside of it, besides your spend, is designed to make you spend more money. And I would say like the biggest thing I would say to not believe is gonna be the conversion tracking. All right, welcome back to the PPC Mastery Podcast. Today, I have another special guest. Uh, he's actually one of the most, if not the most requested guest to come on. So I'm super excited to finally talk to him. Um, you may know him as the co-founder of Solutions 8. He's also chief strategist at Tier 11. Uh, he's a co-author of the, well, in my opinion, best-selling book, You versus Google. Um, my personal opinion, one of the smartest minds in PPC uh, and an absolute PPC legend. Here's the man, the myth, the legend, John Moran. Welcome to the show, man. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I know. I'm going to try to live up to all, to that that hype. That was that was an amazing intro. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure. Now you're actually one of the people that whose content I always look forward to to seeing. And early on in my career as well, um, I watched most of the Solutions Eight videos. I don't really um, consume as much PPC content nowadays as I did back then. Uh, but you were always the one of the main guys that I really enjoyed following and always gave me like really nice, cool ideas to think about. So it's super cool to, to talk to you here. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I try to just, you know, try to put my brain on YouTube. So I think I have like over a thousand videos now over like almost the last, so I've been doing this for 10 years. I think we started the channel maybe five, six years ago. So wow. um, yeah, that's a lot of content. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure, for sure. <laughs> All right. So, uh, John, I, I would like to start this off with one quick question, and that is tell us something about yourself that most people don't know. Yeah. Uh, so I am uh, like a big outdoor survivalist training guy. Um, so self-reliance, there's actually a methodology of outdoor, like kind of camping and hiking called bushcraft, where you go out there with basically like, you know, a flint and steel, not like a ferro rod, but like actually like, you know, whacking a piece of steel against a rock and like a knife and pretty much just kind of like live off the land for as long as you can. So that's always, it's always been kind of fun. I've been into that for man, probably 15 years and uh, wow. it's, it's self-empowering. So I think that, you know, it's kind of like in your professional career, if you're an entrepreneur, you're like making your own way, surviving off of what you can, what you can forage. And so it's kind of uh kind of synonymous with business. <laughs> cool, man. So it's like going back to that primitive urge of just getting out, being out there and hunting and gathering. Yeah. Trying not to get lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, how's, what's the longest period of time that you were able to survive out on your own? So I've, I've only had like the time to do like three days, but you're, oh. I mean, we did it in the snow one time, which is crazy. Wow. So we were like chopping down a tree and, and, you know, bucking it and then, you know, quartering it and doing, you know, feather sticks and basically building a fire and like sleeping on the snow and, you know, kind of building your own survival shelter and that kind of stuff with, uh, I brought a clear plastic tarp. That's all I had. Uh, oh, so it was dude. fun, but it was, it was a good time. <laughs> epic, epic. I epic. came back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still alive. Still alive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man. Um, so uh, here's another question. What is something that you believe about Google ads that most people would disagree with? And I'm actually super curious to hear what you have to say about this. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, where do I begin? Uh, that's kind of the, <laughs> the premise for you versus Google is most yeah. of that information inside of it, besides your spend is designed to make you spend more money. Um, and I would say like the biggest thing I would say to, to not believe is going to be the conversion tracking. Um, the conversion tracking is something that, uh, is going to get worse and worse and worse, uh, till mm. September 31st. Um, that's when we're going to probably see rock bottom. But what I would say for the most part is never measure the success of your business from looking at anything to do with the conversion tracking inside of Google, Google ads holistically. Um, so think about, you know, get good at running Google ads without ever having to track a conversion inside. And that's where I think the biggest misconception is people are like, well, you need to learn that the algorithm needs to learn sort of, um, it comes at a cost of scale. Uh, and that's, what's really interesting about Google ads is they will start to charge you based on your goals, not based on scale. So if you're ever thinking about, you know, what do I trust and what do I not trust in Google ads? The competitiveness is something I would, I would say trust, like who's bidding against and where you are in the position. Those seem to be pretty, pretty accurate. Um, but kind of take off your data hat and put your good marketer hat back on, uh, and be able to manage your account based on the actual impacts of your business. You'll be able to be, you know, you'll, you'll see, um, many more forests for the trees, I guess I would say. Yeah. 
Um, and that's a really cool. And I would love to dive into that, um, get more specific on it, because mm -hmm. in uh, a recent interview that you did on the Perpetual Traffic podcast, uh, which I, I believe is owned by Tier 11, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, fantastic pod podcast. I recommend everyone to subscribe and, and check that out. Um, you kind of exposed how Google is inflating CPCs and uh, you're showing a method of what you're doing to combat that, basically. Uh, and I, I, just looking at how you usually look at Google ads, I think this ties perfectly into the whole you versus Google idea. Um, but I would love to hear your thoughts about what it was that you were able to find um, mm -hmm. and what you're doing now that's differently from what you did before you learned that. Because I think that costs a lot of... Um, well, it's kind of stirred up the PPC industry. Lots of people are talking about it. Um, and, and you can see that you um, have the, the, the deep understanding of, of Google Ads, of the PPC industry as a whole, to be able to do these kinds of things and see this and, and actually test it and then prove it. So I would love to, to um, hear you talk about what it is that you found. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, I'm sure that there's going to be so many more like directions we can take from there. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting is the way that smart bidding works. I think that when everyone has a, a really good holistic understanding of how smart bidding works, everyone kind of pierces the veil. Like it, it's really cool. All of a sudden you have this aha moment where you just begin to have this moment of clarity that unlocks what most people are struggling with. And one of the most reasons, the top reason why people contact me is I can't scale. And and that's kind of, uh, that's usually the main reason why people, people reach out to me. So I want to bring you into a scenario and in what we're seeing in the day-to-day -day, um, aspect of Google ads that is smart bidding. So imagine for, for uh, an example, there's a hundred people in a room Google knows 10 of those 100 people are going to buy today. It does not mean that 90 won't. It just means that Google knows that 10 will or have a very high probability of, of buying today for e-commerce, for example. And you may have five other competitors that you're bidding against for those 10 people. And whomever has the highest spend and CPC wins the majority of those 10 people. That's what smart bidding is. Mm -hmm. it says, I know 10 are going to convert and there's five competitors. You're bidding three, you're bidding two, you're bidding one because your T row S is set at 100 versus 200 versus 300. Um, or your CPA is set at like, you know, TCPA at 50 and 70, a hundred. What that means is that the person that can afford to spend the most and use the, or achieve the least amount of margin will win the highest amount of sales. Mm -hmm. And as you scale that campaign, you earn more of those 10 people, but you also cap out. If you earn seven of those 10, you're stuck. And that's where you just see, I increase my ad spend and I don't get incremental impressions and clicks. You do, but it very slowly and not at the same rate of increase as your CPC. You put 50% in uh, more ad spend and sometimes you spend, get 40% more CPC, but only 20% more clicks. And that's where you're like, uh oh, I can't scale. And that's because smart bidding is locking you into who it knows will convert, not buying more people of good quality, uh, good quality searches. That is also another reason why broad match the search terms don't match up with the keywords. Most often you see search terms that are broad and you're like, well, those shouldn't work, but why did it work? It's because those people, Google knows what they're doing. And it's almost to the point where people can, that are interested in buying, like, let's say a mouse pad can Google something like home equipment and buy your mouse pad. And that's because Google knows, okay, this person's ready to buy a mouse pad. It had nothing to do with the actual search term mm. or the keyword. It just knows that those are relatively close enough that Google can, can earn a sale for you. But if you bid on that search term, like home goods, you're never going to sell that person ever again, or those type of people ever again. And that's why Google wants you to go to smart bidding is because it says, I have 10 people out of a hundred that I know will buy in close similarity to what your website says and what your keyword is, and I'll allow you to buy those. And that's why it doesn't scale. So what my, what my thinking was is, well, how do I get the other 90? How do, how do I get 90 instead of just those 10? Can I pay 90 for good qual or can I pay for the 90 
percent of the people with good quality placement in search terms, but not have to spend the four, five, six, seven dollars per click, go back down to the one dollar. And that's the basis of that test. And the way that I did that was and people think I kill conversion tracking. I did in a sense. And that's why I think there's a large, um, large kind of disruption in the industry is like, well, don't you know, of course, yeah, manual will will do that. What I did is I changed my primary conversion action to YouTube engagements. And YouTube engagements is a trusted Google hosted conversion action that doesn't need to be relearned. So Google's expecting good performance. But when it can't, that's when it spiked up my positioning, it dropped my bid, it basically gave me all of those people that I wanted. And now I no longer run into the limited by bid strategy, because Google doesn't see that this is valuable to me yet. So it's not going to price fix me into quote, quote unquote, the upper echelon or the, the other auctions that aren't available to me, which is l the literal definition of price fixing. So it's kind of the way that once you understand how smart bidding works, you're buying what Google knows rather than buying incremental traffic. And that's, that's the big aha moment that I think people will hear. Wow. Okay. So could you elaborate a little bit on that YouTube engagement uh, thing that you said? Yeah, so there's three algorithms at play. <clears throat> Google has three algorithms that it mainly uses on its inbound campaigns, shopping and search, for example. It's going to be the campaign algorithm. That is your campaign objective. It has the bid strategy, which is obviously what, you know, TCB, TRO, as manual CPC, and then it has the conversion action. So there's three algorithms at work at the same time. When you use a campaign algorithm of, let's say, sales or leads and that means, okay, I'm going to try to get, it's almost like a video action campaign on YouTube. It's like, okay, I'm going to try to get a conversion. And then the conversion action is something that is known and trusted and longstanding. Like let's say YouTube engagements. This does not work if you launch a new, um, a new uh, conversion action, because now you've disrupted one of the three. Now it's relearning. It's learning for the first time. It has no historical precedence and does not trust and doesn't even know if it fires. And so when those two are working kind of, with each other, it will nat naturally drop your bid when it sees less performance all of a sudden happening. And what I did is I just locked into a CPC that showed historically good performance before it scaled with my with my bid. Or sorry, scaled with my budget. So before Google said, now th that $1 works, now it's really valuable to you. So I'm going to cap now now your your audience. So I went back down to that level. I just never let Google know that it was valuable. But there was no disruption to those three algorithms. Um, and that's why this works. Interesting, interesting, um, man. So many, so many ways to, to go from here. Hey guys, real quick, if you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss anything in the future. And feel free to share it with a friend, colleague, or family member because that's the only way we can grow the show. All right, back to the show. Um, but you, uh, I want to uh, take out a quote that you said in the, on the Perpetual Traffic podcast. You, you mentioned platforms are purposely designed to trick you to spend more money. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you mean with that? And can you talk about your findings? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, um, well, I'll, I'll, you know what, here's, here's what's really cool. I'll, uh, I'll share screen here for a moment. Um, yep. And this is what I mean by that. If I was to look at this, one of these manual tests, for example, you see there's no conversions that are being tracked. Mm -hmm. um, if I go into this campaign, actually just go here in campaign settings. If I'm on manual CPC, and that's, this is what's fun is if I'm on a manual CPC and I use, let's say, you know, no conversions and I hit save. If I'm on manual CPC, why can't I do that? That's number one. Well, they, and the other part is number two is if you have to track a conversion, why is that? And why is Google so hyper-focused on calling literally every single client of theirs to get enhanced conversions on because it might increase anywhere between 5% of e-commerce and 14% of lead generation. And why is the push for a maximized conversion value so harsh? I mean, you, you may have a lead generation campaign that says no use value-based bidding, BVB. It's because as soon as Google knows how valuable something is and it sees you scale, that's when they can adjust the pricing based on your goals. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that when you look at the actual... Um, when you look at the actual, uh, we did this here. This is two examples of how I noticed Google is adjusting. And then it was confirmed by Ginny Marvin. 
And that's what I thought was another thing that was really crazy is Jenny's like, yeah, smart bidding is not designed for incre- incremental compressions. I was like, wait a minute, you mean like scale? <laughs> Whoa. Um, that's, yeah, she, she quoted it on a LinkedIn post, which I was like, that's interesting. So there's three areas here. This is ROAS, clicks, and CPC. When you have low ROAS on the same day, you have 30 clicks and you have low CPC. But the next day you have 938. So it says, okay, that you have 930 because you have a low CPC. Now, because this day was good, you look at the following day and then you have a 224 ROAS, but arbitrarily you pay $2.53. Why? Why did my bid go up more than a dollar? Well, because that day then had a slightly poorer performance, so it went back down and gave me a better performance. And Ginny Marvin on the post says, it, smart bidding adjusts based on your goals when set, which means mm-hmm. I'm going to keep you into the T ROAS or TCPA that you want to keep you fat, happy, and complacent. And then the, the, the next kind of case study here, which is we saw zero performance, $1.19. Good performance at $1.60. So I had... Um, I had a two dollar and twenty or two dollar and eleven cent. It you know spiked up fifty cents the next day, but that started to go down here a little bit. So it arbitrarily went down. But they had bad performance, cheap, bad performance, cheap. But I mean, you can see that when there's bad performance, Google will allow you to have twice as many clicks as the previous period with good performance because it's trying to get it back to that goal. So you see that it arbitrarily spikes up your your clicks. Not because you pay for them, but because Google's saying, oh, it's not doing as good. You're going to do what? Stop giving Google money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <So. laughs> but this is, um, it, it kind of makes sense if, if smart bidding is, is taking the averages over a longer period of time, right? So then I guess this would, this data proves that, that one day you have a spike up, then it's going well, it's pushing harder, and then it brings it down. Whether that is good or not, let's put that, let's keep that in the... <laughs> keep that in the middle mm-hmm. um so the, the approach that you have you're just trying to keep that consistent right consistently low cost per click without mm-hmm. sacrificing uh conversions right and so what i did is and that's where i think uh you'll kind of see some of the same stuff from the perpetual traffic podcast but mm-hmm. the cpc was at two dollars and fifty two dollars and seventy eight and I mean, it hit $2 and 80 cents. And the only reason is because my costs jumped from 800 to $1,200 a day. So my CPC hit an all time high. Um, and then you see it kind of flatline and stay there. And then my cost is able to scale out of it. Um, and that was obviously at the same time that I killed conversion tracking. Um, and so because of that, now what's nice is I look back at the days before, like the last seven days compared to the end of May when I started the test, and I can still see that my you know my new visits are nice and cold at 78%. My first-time transactions are increasing. I have 65 first-time, 16 returning. And it's on a cash basis, so if they ever made a second purchase from back then, it's going to show up here on a cash basis, but all for kind of like the, the same cost. Um, CACs dropping, CPC is even getting lower. Like everything's starting to head back in the right direction that I want. My CPMs are fixed. My click the rate's actually getting slightly better. Um, so when you go to switch to like, what happens if I don't want the 10 and I buy the other 90? And it's not been a 100% success for sure. Um, the sales cycles are usually longer on the 90. They're a little bit, you know, more cold to your brand. But does that mean that it's going to have worse performance? No, it just may take longer. Might have to look at other ways to remarket on YouTube and Meta, for example, to help support your spike up in non-brand cold traffic instead of standard shopping. So again, put your good marketer hat back on and think these are humans. You know, I mm. I, I think that once we started to look at, oh, these aren't real people. This is, you know, <laughs> numbers on a screen. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's almost like, no, there's still people that, you know, maybe found out about your product for the first time today and you're mm. not you're kicking yourself because they didn't buy immediately like the other 10 people yesterday on smart bidding because they've already known about maybe your brand or brand like yours for the last two months, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. So you got to put that like sales cycle and marketer hat back on in order to say, do I want the 90 people that will be interested or do I want the 10 that are interested now? It's a, it's a big mindset change that people just, I think the last 10 years we've been so focused on ROAS, we we've become complacent. True, true. Uh, I, I guess I guess that's true. Uh, maybe even lazy. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or train probably. wrong. Well, that's yeah. <clears throat> you know, we, we, to... we learned the we learned to be the 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 turner of the dial rather than marketers. Yeah, and I think it's also a, a lot of people who are getting into PPC now. They don't really have that background in how to actually manage 
manual CPC? Uh, how does it even work? Um, are you using bit layers at all, or is it just that you're setting up a manual CPC bit and that's it? Set up a manual CPC bid, um, high priority. Um, I add about 800 negative keywords a week. Um, so, you know, kind of going back old school, <laughs> which is yeah. like eight years ago, old school. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of manual keywords, but I look at always the search intent and positioning. And if the search intent and positioning are good, I hang tight. I, I don't really, you know, I don't make a lot of, uh, a lot of changes. Um, if I see that, for example, if I, uh, well, you're just going to have to kind of like, you know, Trust me on this one. But if mm -hmm. I look at my search term that was now a 50% less for a cold traffic search term, like this is our brand on Amazon and then our brand here in the in the second position. And these kind mm -hmm. of bounce between, you know, the first and second position. That's okay. I'm building a brand. If they buy on Amazon or they buy on the website, I'm okay with that. I'm driving that awareness to my brand through inbound, which is high intent. Uh, I'm just paying half the price now. Mm -hmm. But I can scale. And <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. So I, I guess you, I assume you don't use broad match then, right? With manual CPC, you really can't. Now, broad match is yeah. not uh, search term based. It's yeah. it's does Google know the ten people? Um, you know what's funny is if you if this is kind of proven by if you ever run a broad match and you see competitor bids in there or competitor search terms. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, why? If you have a if you have a search term that says you know blue mouse pad or sorry if you have a keyword this is blue mouse pad mm. and you get a search for office depot that means that google knows your site they don't mm. care about your keyword they know your site and they know the intent of the person they know that there is a person out there that kind of wants to buy something that you offer and so it's just buying the person where they're at in their journey and that is a huge blockade for people's minds they're like wait a minute so google is almost a few steps away from what's your URL and give me your credit card yeah. <laughs> and less about driving that incremental growth. So yes, we can fall into the smart bidding of it knows who wants to buy your product, not at scale, just however many people are available. But when you switch on broad match and manual, you get the just whole bunch of junk. I mean, it's so irrelevant yeah. and so bad, but that's when you switch back to exact and exact is kind mm -hmm. of like exact broad, <laughs> you know, the exact close, very, the close <laughs> variants are, yeah, it's like yeah. broad match modified again, almost, almost. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, what's cool. It's like switching on exact match will get you, you know, kind of that broad match modifier again. Um, but then you, you bid for positioning and placement. So it's, it's so weird because I switched back here. Like I have like no competition. Like everything's just miraculously just getting better. Cause like now in these industries, I'm like the only person buying the other 90 while everyone's fighting over oh. the 10. It's actually really cool. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that Ginny Marvin actually said on, on a post or in a comment on LinkedIn that smart, she confirmed that smart bidding is not, uh, does not have the goal of driving incremental conversions. Is that it? Yeah, incremental impressions, which is essentially meaning searches because I'm around yeah. inbound. And so I, I kind of. I was blown away by that. It's almost like you're saying yeah. the quiet part, part out loud. Um, yeah. and, and it was actually, uh, it was in this one. And I think there's a few things here that opened my eyes a lot uh, to this sort of uh, phenomenon. And I'll actually pull open the, um, I'll open up the, the post. Uh, as I think it was Raul um, that actually shared this on LinkedIn. Uh, or one of the people that kind of shared on LinkedIn and mm. someone called Ginny out, uh, says, we'll look forward to hearing Ginny Marvin's thoughts on this can't actually be true. We need to game the system in order to trust the system. So called Ginny out. I asked Ginny, uh, she's like, oh yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's not happening. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I guess my question would be, why would remove the conversion value allow me to drop the, uh, bid CPC and then enter into those incremental inventory. And she said, uh, thanks for the question. The keynote, watch this. The key to note is that smart bidding does not optimize for incremental impression delivery. Okay. That's kind of a big deal. Yeah. What does it optimize for then? Usually conversions at a known conversion. And Google can't know everybody in the world, but it has people that are kind of like, okay, these people are moving into more closer to the bottom of the funnel and you're just going to have to pay for them. <clears throat> and then the other part is... With smart bidding, conversion signals are used to predict the likelihood of conversion or probable conversion value, then determine when and how to bid 
based on your goals and targets when set. Mm-hmm. That's why you're, you keep a 4x return, but you can never scale it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this means that you may enter different and more or fewer auctions with different bids than you would otherwise using manual bidding. So basically it's you know all the scenarios that I explained. It could only mean that Google has a finite number of people that it knows are going to convert and whomever. That's why when I use my T-ROAS 40% bid or my low T-ROAS, uh, my low T-ROAS uh, strategy, I just blow into a high amount of sales because mm-hmm. I'm buying more of the available conversions Google knows about. But I get stuck there. Dude, super interesting, man. Wow. Um, so there is a, a key part of this is uh, the tracking side of things. So you, you mentioned you set up uh, YouTube engagements, which is going to be stuck at zero, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, almost <laughs> always. Um, that's a nice hack. How do you, I know you're you're big on third-party attribution, but um, I actually know for a fact that a lot of people have never touched third-party attribution tools. Mm. What are you using to gauge performance and keep an, an eye on um, everything else except for, oh, I'm getting more clicks within my budget. Mm. How am I actually performing? What do you use in that regard? So I'm actually uh, testing another tool that is it's still kind of in development, though. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called Edge Mesh. Um, Edge Mesh is a server-side tracking uh, that is actually delivered at the edge of the site, but not based off of a tag firing. So it's not susceptible to speed or anything. It's also can't be blocked uh, by ad blockers or anything. Cause it's almost like, I can't give away the secret sauce, but it's almost like tagging the person in the parking lot before they get into the store to then accept the cookies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, right. So, uh, so it's kind of, yeah, I don't know how compliant it is just yet, which is yeah, why yeah, I don't yeah, really yeah. recommend people just rushing to it. It's also <laughs> extremely expensive. You're talking like eight to 10 K mm. per month. Um, right. So it's, 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 you know, it's not cheap at all, but it is extremely powerful. And so what, what the edge mesh platform allows me to do is look at hundreds of different uh, intent based signals based on a campaign that is a hundred percent accurate. Um, it does not do attribution though. And I don't really care. I don't need attribution. Mm-hmm. Um, in my opinion, a lot of the clients that I work with have a large amount of their sales happening on Amazon which means if you're one of those people, your in-app is only half true. Your third-party tracking is also only half Mm -hmm. true. What's not going to be half true, though, is the intent because you're still sending them to a page you own. Whether or not they go and buy from a a different, you know, shopping cart, i.e. Amazon, that's when when your in-apps don't make sense. So you're sending your like your T-ROAS, your TCPA, your bid caps and your cost caps on meta, and then you find out, well... Shit, half these people went on Amazon. So now I have to like cut my bids in half and, or I have to double my bid and cut my goals in half and yada, yada, yada. This sort of takes all that out of that, uh, that, that sequence. So I'll, I'll kind of share with you and, and tease a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. We have to blur some stuff out here. This is actually yep. a very, very large, we're, you know, nine figure per year income company. Um, but uh, as this loads, you'll get to kind of see what this looks like here. And so it's loading right now with last 15 days of data and it is insane. Like this thing is probably one of the most powerful tools I've used for intent that I've ever seen. So think about like, if you had a, if you had a view into like Google's metrics, that's Mm -hmm. as close as I can get with this tool here. Um, it's going to take a minute to fetch this data. So I'll I'll just kind of come back, but long story short, I'm looking at are they building carts? What items are they putting into carts? What are they checking out? Um, how many unique users and how many engaged unique users? And what's the average revenue per user? And the entry page, the exit page, the duration, the region, the device, I mean, everything. And so what's nice about it on inbound standard shopping is if I start to scale and I see the intent on a seven-day sales cycle start to drop, I know that I'm reaching into lesser and lesser relevant people. Um, I'm going into the 200 people rather than Google knowing about a hundred, but wanting to give me 10. And so that's the tool that I've been using um, to prove this out. And so it's, it's been pretty positive. And that's for the, for the big clients, right? As you said, if it's eight, eight to 10 K per month, that's uh, out of reach for most. Um, There's, that's why I'm working with them. We're going to be introducing a much lower price um, that mm. doesn't have, they, they do two things, site speed and analytics. Uh, We're breaking those out. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Um, and what about um, the rest? So 
people can't use edge mesh right now uh i know you've in, in the past you've used other tools yeah um like north beam for example it doesn't really matter like what the tool is but more so interested in what you're doing to leverage these tools to get the insights that you're not getting from google then yeah yeah i'm using north beam right now i'm i am for all transparency i'm a, a an equity owner of north beam oh, nice. um nice. so i do like that tool the problem that I have with using an attribution tool is again, that client that I'm running that test on two thirds of all their sales happen on Amazon, sometimes mm. more. So it's like, uh Oh, you know, am I actually getting good performance or are they going elsewhere? Are they still interested? Or am I just like waiting the 10 days to find out? Uh, the sales cycle is also about 14 days. So when I make a change, I gotta wait two weeks and then look at half that data and then hope that it's coming out. So a good way to look at it is just, um, product mer is what I call it. So how much do you spend on the product versus how much do you make on the product? And are they scaling at about the same rate? Or mm. if you're looking at just like Shopify data, every dollar you put in is at least 50 cents worth of more sales on that product. And then you have to go look at Amazon and see is the total sales of that product also increasing at the same incremental. Um, so usually that's a good way to look at it. If you're like, hey, you know, we're just starting off or I'm lower budget, don't really have the money to put into like third party tracking or first party data and all the other stuff, yada, 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 yada. Look at, um, I would say NCAC is your truest North Star. Um, just the cost per acquired first time customer. If you're, if you're scaling up safely and smartly, that should not change by much. It will give you a little bit less or a little bit more, but it should not be, you know, if I put in 20% more spend and your NCAC goes up 20%, nothing's working um that's what i do like about this tool here is uh it's actually loaded now yeah. if i look at something here for example i can see you know engage active cart initiate checkout completed checkout conversion rate unique engage users i mean you name it i have it in this tool and i can wow. see everything about these people um did they did they even look at a product or did they look at a category and did they search something afterwards like all of the intent i have now that I don't need to do conversion tracking. I can see, you know, the active subtotal average revenue per user by campaign. Like <laughs> I know all of this stuff here. It's, and this is this, everything that's on this screen here, these like, I don't know, hundred columns is only what I haven't added out of these columns here as well. So mm -hmm. I know everything about these people. If they've been a new user, how long since they've returned, uh, like days since first seen as an example, like I can see these people are, you know, 33 days old and they're now coming back and converting. So yeah, I, kn I know all this stuff here and that's why I like is I have the ability to do this, but I do share it for free. Like I'm going to teach you how to do this based mm -hmm. on, you know, the millions of dollars that I've spent this last month on this strategy. Um, and hopefully people can just find value in that and maybe, yeah. you know, think outside the box and learn to test on their own a bit. Uh at the very least, that's definitely helping uh, helping people think outside the box for sure. So uh, here's a question that I have for myself about this strategy. Um, I would love to hear your take on it. Mm -hmm. Is how sustainable do you think this approach is? Um, <laughs> 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 Truth is, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I, I've been running it since May 5th. Um, okay. So it's been about, what was that? Uh, May, two so months. yeah, two months in... 10 days and so far so good. Yeah. Um, and it's worked on every test. Now I have seen diminishing points of return in areas that I looked at, which means, oh, my conversions week over week went down. That was true. Um, and then I do see a start to come back. Hmm. And that's why I think that we've went into like the people that are ready to buy now hmm. into starting people on their journey. So. I wouldn't say test this over a seven day, seven day period. Really? I would test this over a quarter to quarter period. Mm -hmm. So don't just throw the whole baby out with a bathwater and say, kill conversion tracking everywhere. Um, yeah. you know, do this smartly and measure, measure smartly, but yeah. your goal is to not necessarily pay a lot less CPC. Your goal is to fix the CPC at a healthy enough price, whatever that may be, but then scale. That's the thing is everyone's like, oh, if you switch to manual, you're going to pay less CPC. That's not the point. I'll, I'll, I'll be fine paying $2 instead of $2.05 as long as that $2 doesn't go up to $6 when I start right. to increase my spend. Right. Super interesting, man. Um, so in terms of uh, the testing this, um, I think one of the, the 
possible pitfalls for people could be is that they try to mimic what you're saying on, <laughs> on YouTube. Um, and that's definitely not on you because you're just openly sharing what's working for you and, and you're smart and you have a lot of experience in, in Google with, with PPC and in Google ads. Um, but I think the, the potential danger that people uh, can find themselves in is if they don't really know exactly what it is that they're doing and what data points they need to be looking at in order to run this type of test. So for yeah. those uh, kind of people who um, you, I just mentioned it before as well. Some people have never done manual bidding. Um, mm. They just grew up on on smart bidding. Um, what would you say to people in uh, on how to actually put this to practice and start testing with this in a sort of safe and controlled way? Um, so yeah. again, that is not to take anything away from you because I think this is really great. But it's just for those who might think like, oh, this sounds smart. I'm going to do it. And then boom, everything just Crashes. Wrecks, <laughs> crashes and burns. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. You're removing conversion tracking. <laughs> and uh, so I what I would say is gain as many sources of data points that you possibly can and track that for like a 10 day period first before making any changes. Don't be like, well, that's cool. I'm going to do that too. Like what you don't know yet is the cost per like new user versus just a CPC. So that's something that is huge. Like ECPNV mm. is something I track very, very, very tightly, which means what is the cost per new person versus cost per click? I mean, that could be $1.50 and three. Now, just that little thing right there can completely wreck your whole day. T row as a TPA, TCPA goes, they go after uh, existing people. They it, it does. The only way they can get your conversion to happen predictably is to go after people it knows and i.e. also people that maybe have been to your site from meta so when you turn on manual bidding you may see your cpc go from let's say two to one okay but your effective cost per new visit just went from you know two to three dollars and 36 cents because now you're buying more new people which means your in-app conversions are going to go down even if you're measuring secondary but you're now have actually cut your budget by 60 percent and so now you're not sure what's going on. So all of those little data points to track your clicks versus, you know, new versus returning, your customers, new versus returning, your overall traffic to that product of what you spent on it, what the, what the conversion was. And was it also from other sources of channels? Like I measure probably 45 to 50 data points for 14 days before I make that switch. So I can look at all the things and be like, okay, these are how those metrics changed and why. And that's why I would say is if you're going to do that, um, it, it kind of goes to my other ma uh, mastermind speech that I, I gave like two months ago. This right here, this is what people are typically measuring, CPA and ROAS. That's pretty much mm -hmm. it. This is what they should be measuring. And at least for a time period before moving into uh, this sort of test, like CAC versus NCAC. Um, so it says a conversion versus conversion that is new. Those are going to be violently different yeah. in terms of cost. So all of these things here on the screen, I won't go through, we don't have time to go through each one of these individually, mm -hmm. but when I measure, be, uh, data points before I just switch this strategy on, these are all the things I have to take into consideration to then say, aha, this is going to actually start to go good after this horrible down period of buying this new traffic as example. So those are all things to just kind of take into consideration is I make this, I make this test very meticulously. It's bold, yeah. but I'm measuring 50 things. So I'm never worried. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that most people are just, they just think that it's, oh, remove the conversion tracking. Uh, okay. YouTube engagements, uh, and then, um, uh, manual CPC and that's it. But there's so much more that goes into it to, keep a finger on the pulse to, to, to gauge whether it's actually successful or not. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Those are some good insights. Yeah. Um, so, uh, two more things about this, uh, before we go to the next one is, is this going to be, or is this your go-to approach right now for most accounts? Is it something that you're rolling out in, well, the accounts that you're managing and overseeing? <clears throat> a few things to take in consideration. Um, if we're not wanting to scale on Google, actually, no, um, mm. I can make Google much more effective by pushing on meta, even by using non-brand standard shopping inbound. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because Google is going to bid for the hottest audience. But sometimes you have a, uh, a WYSIWYG that not many people have heard of. 
you know, I just, I, WYSIWYG is just something, you know, I just made up in my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> it stands for what you yeah. see is what you get. It's an old development term, but you, know, you might have this cool thing nice. that no one knows about. And you're like, oh, I'm going to scale shopping because I kill conversion tracking. Why didn't that work? Right. Like, ah, like it's not going to work. So you have to take into consideration everything in, in that company and say, A, do I want to scale on Google? B, is it smart to scale on Google? And C, is it easier to scale somewhere else? Um, If any of those are no or yes at the end, um, yeah, I won't won't actually do this. So there's a lot of times where 10% of an audience that wants to buy shoes is a million dollars a month. You know, I don't need to scale past that. Um, So, or I'm I'm in a company that sells bulk aggregate. So it's literally tons of rocks, like driveway gravel. Like that, that TCPA and T-Row as bidding that I was testing there was good up to like a 20x scale. My CPC like still only was 60 cents. Okay, cool. Like I'm not hitting that point of diminishing returns. I would say only use this when you're like, I have to scale on Google. It's working well, but I'm just starting to pay crazy amount of more money for the same traffic. That's it. I'm paying the crazy amount more money for the same traffic. 30% more spend. My CPC just went up 30%. I didn't get anybody new. That's when you use this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So first, like check your data as well over a longer period of time to see if you see those spikes. And then that would be an interesting opportunity to start testing this, right? Yeah. All right, except for, uh, apart from the things that you mentioned about scaling and not scaling. Yeah, don't just do it because it's a cool trick that you want to see if you could beat Google. Like yeah. take, take your business or your customers, you know, Right. strategy and, and goals first. <laughs> yeah, man. That's that's probably the best note, step to take first, always. Um, and uh, is there is there um, anything about this approach that you're still trying to figure out? Uh, no, not yet. It's actually, mm. I've, I have, I, no joke, I've probably spent over a million dollars on it so far since I've introduced yeah. this. Um, I am trying to break this, by the way. It's not like, I don't recommend yeah. this, honestly. I don't recommend it to anybody. I'm just sharing you the cool shit that I'm doing. Um, yeah. I, but I really, I wouldn't just say like, do what I'm doing. Cause you'd have to probably pay me a lot of money for this, me to teach you all the stuff that I'm actually yeah. doing. I'm, I'm sharing with this so that if this becomes like a good standard strategy or something that we can, we can rely on that people will, will kind of uh, be able to start to start to adopt, or at least, you know, think about, can I do this? I've been following mm-hmm. John. I've been learning from it. He's teaching me as he learns himself. Um, and is this something I want to test too? Because I think that's, that's where the magic can really happen is, is if we can find an area that this is, you know, as solidified as possible, um, it'll be, it'll be good. And I think that that's, what's, what we're, we're looking at is, is the same thing on this one here on this, this company, this is that bulk company where they sell the, the rocks. Um, Mm -hmm. when we looked at our shopping campaign here. We killed our conversion tracking and shopping. What's funny is our brand, my one little brand campaign, spends a thousand dollars now to make one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Like it's insane. And this company's brand new, by the way. Um, but that's just because we spent ninety four to make five point four million here. This is all right. conversion valuable. We're only tracking one thing, and we sell nice. tons of rocks at thousands of dollar AOV. So it's great. But our um, our our brand now is is getting where everything was getting in April. Like it's insane. So that's just because we kill conversion tracking. So, so many more people you see coming back in the brand, which means your top of funnel is mm-hmm. working. So all those little things like, Hey, we hit a point diminishing returns and we have zero competitors. So why is my ad spend or my CPC tripling? We're the only people in this town selling tons of rocks on Google shopping. Like there's right. no reason for this to be price fixed. So those are all things I think like, you know, it really helps the small people, which I love. <laughs> mm, yeah yeah and it also proves some of the suspicions that everyone kind of has you know of what's going on under the hood and behind the scenes and we we just can't really prove it and now this uh yeah just allows us to think on a on a different level as you said like think outside the box so uh, yeah. i love that yeah um all right so uh, i have a quick question about the, your um approach to, to testing it's just just short i'm actually curious what, what does your innovation process look like because this is something that you know comes from you and in, in tier 11 i i assume um what does that look like you're just sitting down and brainstorming ideas and oh, maybe this will be a cool test what does it look like for you yeah you know what's funny is i i had this epiphany um because i don't track uh in app um everything else is tracked elsewhere most of the time manually actually in a spreadsheet um i noticed that 
and I've worked with 470 accounts, by the way. So that's that's my my depth of, of, of scope of range. And so that's where I, I get a lot of data quickly. And I noticed that the majority of accounts that have either failing or non-existent conversion tracking were stupid easy to scale. And I was like, oh, man, this is now kind of obvious to me. I'm kind of feeling stupid. I didn't notice this five years ago. Um, and so I started to investigate all of the accounts that are getting like a five, six, and even 10 mer media efficiency ratio, like put a dollar and get, you know, 10 out, um, for companies that have like sometimes long sales cycles, large AOVs, but Google never went over like 65 and 70 cents in CPC. And then I also noticed on the complete flip side on accounts that were doing good, I dumped $10,000 more a day in spend. And then had to go tell the client how we spent fifty thousand dollars more to get one percent more new, more cold traffic, and it felt like an idiot. So I just kind of you know it came at a perfect time where I'm like, wait a minute, and oh, like all of a sudden that just kind of clicked for me there. So it's just because I'm in this like ten hours a day that just like it ended up just kind of happening in my brain where I'm like, these are easy to scale and cheap. Those I can't even get more traffic, and I was like. This is only spending like 10 grand. This is spending 100 grand. I'm tapping out what Google wants me to get. I'm like, all of a sudden just became like a little epiphany. So I didn't have like necessarily a brainstorming. It was just kind of like yeah. a happenstance. But um, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to share that with everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. And it, that comes with experience as well. So how long have you been in, in the in the PPC game? It's like 10 years plus? Yeah, about uh, this actually just past 10 years. Yep, this yeah, last 10 month. Years, so yeah, there you go. Um, all right, man. Well, John, I want to transition into yeah. a few rapid fire questions let's do it so it's going to be this or that no it depends and no elaborations okay <laughs> all right all that's right. hard for one. me <laughs> yes i know i know <laughs> and no it depends um okay all right the first one is pmax or standard shopping standard shopping yeah i expected that one google has advertisers best interest in mind agree or disagree disagree broad match yes or no no AARs, uh, automatic apply recommendations, but uh, good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> I like how we're both good. laughing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> suicide. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, uh, let's see. Manual bidding or smart bidding? <sighs> Manual. <laughs> Manual. <laughs> nice. Was that a tough one? It was because it's smart bidding is excellent only until you want to scale. Mm. But I, I, but if you don't want to scale, smart bidding. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Will all match types except broad be gone in two years? Yes. Mm. And will search and shopping campaigns be around in two years? Yes. Mm. So what do you, what do you think? Uh, this is not like a this is no more rapid fire uh, answering. <laughs> um, what do you think it's going to look like in the next two years or so? Google ads. I do think that search and shopping will still be around. Um, only because I know that Google has heard the violent reaction as to Pmax, and that's why they developed demand gen so quickly. Um, it's because they're like, uh oh, we found out it's capturing more demand than generating. And so mm -hmm. I think that unless they nail it with something that actually can generate demand, the only way for them to do that is to not use smart bidding in those platforms, unless those smart bidding things are like, you know, new visits or you know new impressions but if they are keeping with the same mantra that they have for last since inception which is roas is king and conversions are king you cannot fundamentally develop a campaign that will generate demand um that's why youtube does it so well but it doesn't track conversions very well <laughs> right. yeah Man. Um, all right. One final question for you. Uh, if you had to share three golden nuggets about driving results with Google ads, what would that be? Yeah. Um, go back to avatar development and mm. add copy. That's, that's where you're going to be generating the most amount of demand. Um, get good at understanding the difference between capturing demand and generating demand. YouTube generates demand. Performance max captures demand. I've proven that actually. Um, that is something I think is really interesting. And then also understand how the algorithms and bidding strategies try to target existing website traffic first before going incremental. Hmm. 
those are things that will that will stop you from leading down the row as pitfalls yeah man super interesting and thanks for sharing all these uh, all these epic insights uh this is one that i'm going to be uh watching back myself <laughs> <laughs> so many cool uh, cool nuggets so thank you for sharing so so openly as always yeah. um where can uh where can people find you uh, john where can people follow you yeah so uh Follow me on LinkedIn um, and tier 11 is going to be producing more and more content. We're kind of getting a content schedule. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows this, but I end up, uh, I sold solutions eight mm -hmm. um, and I'll be, you know, kind of leaving there, you know, someday soon kind of thing. Uh, so that's why you'll see less on solutions eight YouTube channel of me and, and more of me elsewhere, but tier 11 uh, to contact me and LinkedIn to questions and to follow me there and everything like that. Awesome. I'll awesome. be posting a lot more there as well. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that because I checked your LinkedIn profile and the last post was from six months ago. So it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah, get back yeah. into the posting cadence. <laughs> I have, uh, we have another very large education platform called uh, Revenue Rush. Um, mm. It's actually with a current partner of ours. We scaled his business to $100 million in four years. Um, nice. And everything that we know how to do, use that. I mean, running like a brand campaign training is like two and a half hours. It's, I mean, mm. so everything that we've done, we've been filming for over a year now. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something that, uh, we'll be launching here in the next three or four months. So that's where I've been putting all of my kind of, uh, education power behind. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, lately. Yeah. Um, cool, man. Sounds good. All right. Well, John, thank you very much once again. And, um, to everyone else, thank you for listening, watching if you're on YouTube and, uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, all that stuff. And we'll catch yeah. you on the next episode. Peace. <laughs> Thanks everyone. All right, that's the end of this episode of the PPC Mastery Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you don't want to miss any future episodes, we're going to be back next week. Then don't forget to subscribe and share with a friend, family member or a colleague because uh, that's the only way we can grow this show. Now, there's two more things I want to share with you. If you want to take your Google Ads game to the next level, the first one is if you want to get advanced Google Ads tips delivered straight into your inbox on Mondays and Fridays, head over to ppcmastery.com slash newsletter to subscribe to our newsletter called the PPC Edge. And next to that, if you want to really, really, really take your skills to the next level and become the best Google Ads specialist you can possibly be, then consider joining the PPC Hub, which is our coaching and community platform for experienced Google Ads specialists. You can find everything about it on pbcmastery.com slash hub. And with that said, I'll catch you in next week's episode. Peace.